Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson, and it is September 26, 2016. Now, the 2016 U.S. presidential race, just a little over a month away, and while it's too early to call the race, it's not too early to begin asking, what's going on here? Now, as you know, I've been a huge critic of the role of the Federal Reserve and other central banks recently in blowing serial bubbles that have only enriched the few at the expense of the many, while enormously increasing the risk of a major financial accident, the likes of which the world has probably never before seen. But nothing happens in a vacuum, and the Fed's policies have led to the most dramatic widening of both both wealth and income gaps, and those are fueling quite predictable and overdue, in my estimation, public resentment, and that is changing the political landscape. Now, as I said, nothing happens in a vacuum. Back with us today to discuss all of this and much more is Mr. David Stockman, economic policymaker, politician, and financier. And as I'm sure you know, Mr. Stockman served as the director of the Office of Management and Budget in the Reagan administration and was the youngest cabinet member of the 20th century. He's author of The Great Deformation, The Corruption of Capitalism in America, which came out in April 2013. Now, that's a blunt and very realistic and honest, uh, sometimes scathing uh, examination of the various fiscal and policy blunders that have degraded our current and future hopes for prosperity. And he's got a brand new book out titled Trumped, A Nation on the Brink of Ruin and How to Bring It Back. Welcome back to the program, David. Very happy to be with you again, Chris. There's a lot to talk about here. Um, and I think the one thing I should clarify is that this election is enormously important, but it's not entirely uh, about the candidates per se, but about the fact that much of the country is beginning to recognize that we've been on the wrong path for a long time and we're reaching a dead end. And that's why, you know, on the cover of this new book, uh, I have a map of America and uh, the east and west coast are uh, colored, shaded, and the uh, vast area in between is in white. I call it flyover America. And part of the book is to try to explain the phenomena of the Trump campaign, which came out of nowhere, and why there seems to be such an unexpected groundswell of economically driven support. Of course, the elite media wants to uh, blame it on racism and xenophobia and, you know, small mindedness of one type or another. But I think the underlying driver here, uh, the underlying alienation uh, comes from an economic policy that has benefited enormously the bicoastal elites, and we go through that, a very small share of the population that lives off finance, uh, venture capital, and the enormous expansion of the warfare state and welfare state in Washington versus uh, the rest of America, call it the 90% uh, to use a uh, general term. But the, the thing that I try to demonstrate in the book is that since 1987, when Greenspan arrived at the Fed in this era of bubble finance, as I call it, incepted, we basically have a bifurcated economy. Uh, the bottom 90% of the population has no more real net worth today if you use an honest inflation uh, measure to, to deflate uh, nominal values, has no more net worth today than it did in 1987. That's uh, nearly 30 years of going nowhere. The top 1% has gained 300% in net worth in the, for, uh, the Forbes 400 uh, to take the final uh, clip on this uh, is a thousand percent gain. Now that's not um, capital. That's not market capitalism at work. That is a, as I called it, a deformed or mutant uh, system of crony capitalism and finance-driven 
uh, economic life uh, coming right out of the uh, central bank and uh, that whole uh, complex of uh, unsound policy uh, that has produced a result uh, that is um, very uh, uh, unsustainable. Not only has there been no net worth gain, as we lay out in the book, but if you just go to the year 2000, uh, real um, uh, median household income, again, deflated with, uh, I think, an accurate uh, measure of the cost of living faced by most households, is down uh, nearly 20% from where it was when Bill Clinton was shuffling out of the White House. Uh, another uh, measure I use is breadwinner jobs. I have a system for tracking those that I report on my blog, but it's basically, you know, manufacturing, energy, mining, construction, the white collar professions, business management, and uh, the core uh, of the economy. There are no more breadwinner jobs today. There's about 71 and a half million or half of the BLS count. That number is the same as it was, in fact, slightly lower than in January 201. So you don't have, there's some fundamental failures going on here, shrinking living standards and real incomes, uh, a failure uh, of the economy to generate real jobs and growth, and a bubble finance system that is showering a tiny fraction of the population with huge uh, gains, uh, what I and they're inflated gains to be sure, in the value of financial assets. So I think it is out of that kind of uh, economic uh, witch's brew that the politics in America are being unsettled and roiled uh, like uh, we haven't seen uh, for a long time, if ever. And that's why this election is so crucial um, because uh, all of these forces, I think, are uh, being brought to bear uh, on, the, uh, on the campaign as it unfolds uh, in ways that we haven't seen for a long time. Now, David, all of that is, is obviously fuel in this fire. And uh, lest people at this point are thinking you, you've written a book in support of Trump per se, I, I want to quote from your book here. You wrote, our purpose at this point, however, is to dispel any illusion that Donald Trump, the man and his platform, offers any semblance of a remedy. In the great scheme of history, the Donald's role may be to merely disrupt and paralyze the status quo end quote. I'm really intrigued by that view because what you're saying here to me, if I've heard this right, is that the status quo has has been in place since the Greenspan Fed. It's created this enormous structural and deformed landscape that we see where structural wealth disparity is just part of policies. These were active policies that people pursued uh, with some aims that I guess made sense to them. And it's hurting the bottom 90% can't even call that middle America because this is uh, maybe even the bottom 95%. And this now has political ramifications. Uh, did they? Did, so the question is, you know, did, do the people in power see that? I don't get any sense that Hillary and her handlers in the press really understand what's happened here. And, and second question, how could they not understand what's happening here? Well, that's uh, uh, that's the heart of the matter. And, uh, you know, the point they make about Hillary, she's experienced, she's been there, she's informed. Those are exactly the reasons why uh, I uh, hope she's not elected, because she basically is, if in some sense, the class president of a failed generation that has been running policy mm -hmm. in the wrong direction, war abroad, debt at home, uh, bubble finance on Wall Street, a rogue central bank that has essentially taken over uh, economic life for all practical purposes in this country. Uh, you know, there's a generation that has put that in place and now they're, uh, they're blind. I call it Imperial Washington uh, is blind to, uh, the, to the consequences and the unsustainability and the unjustness um, and the failures of the policies uh, that they put in place. So, uh, in that sense, I see Trump as a disruptor. 
that he hasn't spent 30 years drinking the Kool-Aid in the Imperial City. He hasn't learned all the reasons why you shouldn't raise questions about what the Fed is doing. He hasn't learned all the reasons why we still need to have NATO and uh, 300 uh, bases around the world when the Cold War ended, uh, uh, you know, three decades ago. So what I think is refreshing about Trump is that he lets loose of common sense observations every now and then that at least begin to crack the facade uh, of the status quo and uh, the Washington assumption and the elite media assumption that uh, all of this uh, is working uh, 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 just uh, as intended. And we had a scare in 208, but that's behind us. It was a once in a hundred year flood and uh, uh, we can uh, move forward uh, with uh, a much more uh, optimistic uh, outlook. I, I think that is just terribly wrong. It's just completely upside down. Uh, we've been drifting towards the wall, um, kicking the can, and uh, there isn't a lot of runway left uh, in this whole uh, scheme, which is, uh, you know, on the verge of failure. That's why I call it the brink of ruin. The, the heart of my book really is not uh, Trump per se, it's the brink of ruin that's been created by uh, 30 years of, of, of uh, you know, misrule by the Washington Wall Street elites. And uh, Trump is a symptom that the political system is finally waking up to that fact and uh, something has to give. Now, uh, I think we're gonna have a, if he wins, we're gonna have a wild and woolly time for several years, if not his entire term, because there will be no, you know, there will be no consensus about anything. And there will be questions raised about everything from foreign policy to the independence of the Fed, um, to, uh, you know, energy and regulatory policy and, and the whole gamut. So um, this, in my judgment, it will not be a confidence builder uh, in the casino. Uh, they're suddenly going to uh, discover on Wall Street that Washington doesn't have any firepower fiscally because we're heading back to triple digit uh, deficits. Uh, and uh, the Fed and the other central banks are out of dry powder. So there is no rescue brigade uh, when we uh, get another shock in the financial markets. This time, I think uh, we're going to have a long lasting and um, a correction that will not be instantly reversed as it was after dot com uh, and as it was uh, in March 2009. Uh, when they launched into this uh, crazy uh, period of ZERP and QE. So, uh, you know, we're, we're heading into a totally different landscape that um, is going to uh, really shock uh, the financial system, even as the uh, political system uh, undergoes uh, this uh, unprecedented uh, uncertainty uh, that lies ahead in, in this election. Now, David, you've said uh, quite a lot in there, and the pieces that really jump out at me were the words unsustainable. Obviously, you know, we've tried to print our way to prosperity, and this is a wholly unsustainable system. And the core of this is that um, you mentioned that, uh, you know, the, the rallying cry, such as it is for Hillary, is that she's the most qualified and that, and that the Donald then is unqualified. But this is precisely why so many people are gravitating to the Donald, because he's unqualified, because to be qualified means that you support the ideas of this increasingly interventionist Federal Reserve that is now assumed for itself, taking over all facets of our economic lives. And most people in the press distinctly seem to be unaware of this idea that money printing is a zero-sum game. So you print money, and look at all these people getting rich, and we point to that, and it's the American dream, and oh, but wait, they're all Forbes 400 people getting really stupid rich. It, not understanding that they didn't get rich because they were smart and intelligent and built something. They got rich because the Fed handed that to them. The second part of that question is, who did they take it from? The flyover states, the regular people are, are being screwed, if I could be blunt about this. And we have been for a long time. 
that's finally coming up into the into the forefront. Of course, this has a political dimension. So when Yellen's out there on her FOMC statement saying, oh, no, we're very much not political. Of course you're political. And how dare you say that your policies haven't exacerbated the wealth gap? It's 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 insulting at this point. And I think that's my personal ire. But I, I think people are sharing that. No, I agree with that. And that's the reaction I had uh, when she made that statement over and over, uh, that we're not political. I mean, this Fed is the most ideological uh, Fed that we've had in history (laughs) since 1913. They're dyed-in-the-wool Keynesian interventionists. They have a view on the world that government stands at the center, that capitalism is some kind of... uh, you know, uh, invalid that is constantly getting sick or stumbling and heading towards recession or depression without the ministrations of the state, whether it's uh, fiscal stimulus or monetary stimulus or, you know, uh, pegging the interest rates and managing uh, the yield curve and uh, backing up uh, the stock market, everything else they do, that is a profoundly political point of view. And even worse, it's undemocratic, because at least if you believe those things as a fiscal Keynesian, as they did back in the 60s and 70s when I was starting out in this, you had to persuade uh, people who had been elected uh, in the 50 states of America that this was going to help and that running up the debt was nothing to worry about, et cetera. But now that we've gone, that uh, the venue has changed, and this is what I fault Greenspan, uh, you know, for, he should be everlastingly faulted for this, but he essentially picked up the Keynesian brief and trotted it over to the Eccles building and essentially installed Keynesian activist interventionist uh, policy um, in an institution that's uh, unelected, unresponsive to the uh, to uh, to the electorate, and that becomes a uh, ingrown uh, power uh, and center of groupthink uh, that uh, you know was unimaginable uh, even in 1987 when he uh, stumbled down this path. Uh, in the wake of the October uh, crash. So uh, that, I think, is the larger point. Um, And at least Trump has begun to let loose a few uh, stray balls uh, in the direction of the Fed. You know, he said this is a false market. This is an artificial Mm -hmm. interest rate. Uh, Yellen ought to be ashamed of herself. These are, yeah, these are just little sound bites. They're uh, probably no more than that or slogans. But if you think about it, what mainstream uh, candidate or uh, president or, you know, advisor to a president has said one word of even mild uh, criticism about the Fed for the last 30 years? (laughs) They haven't. And uh, so at least maybe we're opening up that debate and I hope he takes it further. The savers in America are getting killed. The retirees are getting killed. Uh, As I have a little uh, section in my book, I point out that if you were a steel worker and had a pretty good wage and you sweated out a lifetime in the mill uh, and uh, were thrifty and saved $250,000 in cash over a lifetime, which would be hard to do, very high savings rate, uh, nevertheless, today, under the Fed's uh, pegged interest rates, if you want to keep your retirement in a liquid bank account, which a lot of uh, older people do, uh, you're earning one cappuccino uh, worth, uh, Starbucks cappuccino worth of interest a day for a lifetime of work, thrift, and savings. Now, now that is beyond unjust. It's almost uh, cruel and unusual punishment you know, uh, in the constitutional sense of the word. So that's the first point. The other point, a big point I have in my book is this idea of 2% inflation targeting is totally novel. It didn't even exist in the 1980s uh, when uh, we were uh, trying to turn around the country in the Reagan administration. I doubt it existed even seriously in the 1990s. Inflation targeting was uh, the brainchild of Bernanke and a few other um, you know, far out Keynesians who stumbled into the right positions, uh, introduced it into policy, 
uh, after the turn of the century and made it formal in 212. But if you think about 2% inflation as a systematic matter of policy, that means that you're targeting wage earners who have to compete with the China price if you're in a goods uh, supplying sector of the economy or the India price if more and more you're in the service sectors of the economy where you do have the ability through technology and communications to move jobs, you know, like uh, data processing, call centers and all the rest of it offshore. So what, what they're failing to realize is that 2% uh, inflation is not a virtue. It has no relationship to economic growth or the other objectives they talk about, but it's actually uh, do, having a devastating negative impact on, um, as a, again, as I call it, flyover America and the jobs in the lower half, uh, let's say middle to lower half of the job uh, spectrum that are in harm's way due to offshoring both on the service and uh, the good side. So, you know, the, the, the idea you get from listening to Bernanke or Yellen or any of the others is, well, you know, 2% inflation, uh, that's the policy. Everybody knows what it is. We uh, march forward, lockstep together. What counts is real uh, as we see it, uh, adjusted for inflation with our deflators. And uh, so let's, uh, you know, move along. There's nothing here to see. I think that's profoundly wrong destructive and dangerous. There isn't lockstep 2% for everybody. Uh, again, people at the top of the uh, uh, wage uh, scale are in jobs like good government jobs or finance that aren't going to be offshored, so they keep up with or stay ahead of inflation. Those that are in uh, the global uh, labor market uh, get uh, uh, either uh, they jobs get offshored and they lose good jobs, or uh, they're uh, forced to take wages that don't keep up with inflation, and they get further and further behind. So the two the, the two evils that I've gone after in the book are one two percent inflation targeting, which I think is killing uh, the jobs market on Main Street and uh, uh, real living standards. And the zero percent uh, inflate or uh, interest rate uh, targeting, and after 96 months, that's where we'll be in December. Uh, you have to call it uh, the permanent policy. Those two things uh, are just um, devastating in their impact and uh, profoundly uh, anti-democratic. Because if you would put to a vote in Congress uh, zero interest rates for the next eight years it wouldn't have gotten, you know, a corporal's guard worth of votes because uh, the people impacted uh, pensioners and savers and middle class uh, producers uh, would have uh, responded overwhelmingly in a negative way. The same thing uh, with inflation targeting. I, I don't think, uh, you know, you would have a corporal's guard of support <clears throat> in the uh, Congress uh, for inflation targeting if, uh, it was explained that the impact is not, uh, you know, uh, uniform, but it's highly uh, inequitable and destructive to the people who uh, can least uh, uh, deal with it. Now, let me add potentially a, a third evil to that, which is uh, targeting 2% inflation while misrecording and misreporting it. Uh, I'm wondering if you tackle that third one at all in here, which is uh, the idea that our government statistics, which we've been treated to a bevy of them lately, which have zero credibility to me, uh, the sharpest rise in median income in 20 years. Um, uh, we just heard that uh, uh, more people than ever, millions have been lifted out of poverty. And, and uh, the article failed to note something you noted in your book, which was that over the past 16 years, Persons in households receiving means-tested benefits is more than doubled from 50 million to 110 million. I think that had a little lifting effect. But inflation itself, come on. If you're living in a major metropolitan area, you've been renting, and you have any exposure at all to prescription drugs, you are not experiencing 2% CPI inflation. You're experiencing, I don't know, 8% or more. It's right. got, and it's really, really damaging. 
Yes, exactly right. In fact, we that we address that front and center. We actually created something, and I use it in my blog too, from time to time, called the flyover CPI. And what we essentially did was take the four horsemen of inflation, uh, which uh, is food, energy, medical, and housing. We reweighted them to 66% of this flyover CPI versus 55, recognizing that that's what the overwhelming share of household paychecks and budgets go to. We then said, let's get an accurate medical deflator. And so we've used a private one that um, is uh, widely regarded, the Millman Index. And then we said for housing, for crying out loud, you can't use this uh, owner equivalent interest, mm -hmm. which, you know, they uh, survey a few thousand people and say, if you were going to rent your castle, what do you think the rent rate would be? And how does that compare to last month? It's ridiculous. So we took um, as a measure of housing expense, we took the asking rent, rent index uh, produced uh, bo both uh, by the uh, uh, BLS itself, as well as several private ones and came up with a better measure of housing expense. Now, when you do that, the inflation rate year in and year out since 1987 has been 3.1% per annum. It hasn't slowed down very much at all, even as we've gone through this commodity deflation um, in the last year or two. Since the year 2000, it's up 3.1%. If we look even in the last year, it was up nearly 2%, and that's with the uh, big uh, one-time uh, gain from uh, the oil collapse and uh, certain other uh, commodities. So uh, what we then do throughout the book is whenever we're talking about inflation-adjusted values, whether it's median income or household net worth and lots of other things we can look at, we uh, deflate those nominal values with our flyover CPI. And I think we uh, present a, a profound truth. Now, let me just give two examples of this. In one chart, we basically show the change from the year 2000 between the flyover CPI constructed as I've uh, described it and the Fed's favorite, what I call sawed off uh, measuring stick, uh, you know, the uh, PCE deflator less food and energy. If anyone got by without food and energy since the year 2000, more power to them, uh, it would be some kind of miracle. But the point is, if you compare those two, what we find is that the uh, Fed's measuring stick is up less than 40% since the turn of the cent or 30% since the turn of the century. Um, the CPI, uh, flyover CPI, as we've uh, constructed it, is up 70%. Now, this is profound because it says there is a 40% gap just in the last 16 years between what our policymakers in the Eccles building think is going on in America uh, in terms of inflation and real uh, in, uh, values uh, and what is actually being experienced uh, out on Main Street or in Flyover America. And if they're wrong by 40%, they're wrong directionally on everything that's happened. So even with last week's phony numbers, and we, we could address that later on the uh, surprising, quote, surprising gain in median real income in 215, even with that, uh, what uh, we show is the um, real median income um, is down 17% since the year 2000, if you use the flyover CPI versus a couple of percent uh, if you use the regular uh, BLS measures. Wow. Now, there's, there is a huge difference, obviously, between shrinking living standards for the median households, and this is, you know, out of the 119 million households, the difference between kind of treading water, which is bad enough, and that's what the uh, regular BLS deflator shows, and it going backwards by 17%, you know, that's fundamental. And, and that th those are totally different economic circumstances, and they have uh, dramatically different uh, economic implications as well, or political implications as well. So when people uh, say uh, we're being uh, left behind, we, we, you know, we can't, we're not going to take it anymore. It's not based on uh, 
you know, in my view, uh, simply cultural prejudices or, you know, bad motivations like xenophobia and racism and all the rest that is charged by the elite media. I think it's a uh, it's a uh, indication, a signal of economic distress that is real and that uh, policymakers uh, in the imperial city are oblivious to because they believe all the data that comes out of the uh, statistical mills. Now, the worst one at this, frankly, uh, she's so naive, it's beyond belief, is uh, uh, the chairman of the Fed, uh, Janet Yellen. She seems to believe that every one of these, all this data that comes out of the uh, BLS and other statistical mills is accurate to the decimal point and that uh, even if the uh, you know uh, core CPI less food and energy is 1.6 percent, which is damn near two percent, they still have room to go to uh, hit their target. You know this is crazy. You can't measure anything that precisely. There's a whole problem uh, that uh, some people are aware of about what the general price level is anyway. But we're, we're uh, you know, we have a central bank being run by paint by the numbers, mechanical fanatics uh, who, you know, continue to sit on the money market rate, which is the heart, is the core price in all of capitalism and all of financial markets, because from the money market, uh, everything else more or less eventually gets priced, the yield curve, equities uh, converts everything else. But uh, the point is, they're literally, um, you know, uh, focused on decimal point uh, differences that uh, aren't even valid measures. And in the process, what they're doing is just continuing to distort dramatically uh, pricing in the financial markets. I mean, as we said before, if you get to December, which we will without a, another change in rates, that means roughly 96 months, the Fed had the economy lashed to the zero bound. And if there's anything we know, and that is zero cost overnight money is the mother's milk of speculation, like uh, no other uh, force uh, <laughs> in uh, the uh, economic world. And so they have unleashed speculation that they don't even begin to understand how it's unfolded and worked its way into the warp and woof really uh, of the economy and what's going to happen is when we finally hit some kind of tripwire or catalyst or black swan whatever you want to call it there's going to be stuff coming out of the woodwork everywhere blowing up and they're going to say oh well you know this is one time we didn't know it was there <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, of course they don't know it's there because there are millions of people every day being given a price signal that you can borrow money overnight and put on an options position. You could go to your uh, Wall Street uh, prime broker and they'll come up with all kinds of uh, customized uh, spread trades and uh, financial uh, structured uh, finance trades that um, you know are not visible to anybody, but certainly uh, not uh, the people sitting in the Eccles building saying that all val you know valuations are normal. We don't see any bubbles around, uh, and there's nothing to worry about. This, this is uh, you know it's damn near criminal uh, what they're doing. And when this blows, and I think the great uh, uh, you know uh, opening that may occur if Trump is elected is that when the market blows this time, if it happens on a Trump, uh, uh, during the Trump uh, White House, there is going to be uh, a huge investigation, uh, a huge political uh, recrimination against the Fed. The Republicans will finally uh, be unshackled because this is a Fed run by Democrats and Keynesians and people who uh, have made it clear uh, that, uh, you know, they want to see a continuation of the status quo. So uh, all of this uh, is scary uh, because who knows how it uh, unfolds and unwinds. But on the other uh, hand, in some um, longer term way, it's encouraging because maybe 
you know, this fantasy land uh, that we're in uh, is, uh, you know, coming to an end and uh, we're going to get some open um, and honest, uh, uh, you know, discovery of uh, the folly that uh, has been uh, underway for so many years now. Well, David, I love the way you've approached this in, in your book, Trumped, A Nation on the Brink of Ruin and How to Bring It Back, because uh, what you've done here, uh, particularly in this in this last comment, is you said, look, uh, here's the cognitive dissonance that people are facing uh, in this political cycle. There are people, the majority of people have faced in a 17% erosion since 2000 in their actual living standards. Their purchasing power has shrunk. They felt it. And these are even the people who kept their jobs, not the ones who even lost their job and had to take a lower paying job. They got double whammied. So there's all these people who are feeling this pressure and this pain. And the media takes all of that and says, oh, if you don't want to continue that, you must be a racist. Right. Right. And, and that's just like there's such a terrible gap between the reality people are facing, which is we need to start doing things differently and being called a racist if that's what you want to do, uh, that that maybe Trump isn't like the perfect uh, standard bearer for this, but he's exposed it. And so here we are now. Uh, here's a question that's really important. I, I have to ask it while we have time. Uh, I personally know plenty of very financially savvy individuals who are worried silly about the coming financial crash. And the more experienced they are, the more worried they seem to be. So leaving them aside, my, I want, what's your advice? What do you, how do, what's your advice for ordinary people who are spending their time coping with all this increasing complexity and the diminishing purchasing power and who maybe aren't spending as much time as they should be learning about the true risk they face. Maybe they, they can't, they don't have time. But if you get to talk to them, what do you say to them? Well, that's a very uh, profound and also hard question because the the whole financial system has been so uh, distorted and deformed that it's really not safe, it's not stable. And so therefore, you know, the idea that you can get out of harm's way by maybe buying some utility stocks because, uh, you know, they'll hold up better uh, when a uh, crash comes or getting uh, your portfolio mix more towards fixed income and less towards uh, equity. Uh, you know, those are the traditional kinds of advice. And I think none of it is suitable to the uncharted waters we're in today. When the bond market is in a bigger bubble than the stock market. You know, the stock market is in a giant bubble and it's funded all kinds of, you know, um, speculation directly and indirectly that is spread uh, throughout the uh, financial system, uh, whether it's uh, junk bonds or, as I said, uh, structured finance uh, of every kind. So the best advice to people is if you're in the stock market, get out completely. If you're in the uh, any kind of duration-based uh, uh, fixed income, get out because you can't have 13 trillion of government debt trading at sub-zero rates in the world and not expect that one of these days there's going to be a huge uh, implosion of that market. And when the sovereign debt markets start to crater, they're going to take everything with them, corporate, uh, you know, investment grade corporates, uh, high yield, uh, real estate, uh, securitized real estate uh, and everything else. So uh, I think uh, you have to get out of those. I think there will the coming crisis will be a repudiation of Keynesian central banking. And that means that gold will have a new era to shine. I think it will be seen as the default asset um, that people uh, will believe in once uh, the central banks have uh, failed and become visibly uh, discredited and under political attack. And that's, you know, it's another whole topic we could talk about. It's beginning to happen uh, both here and in, uh, in Europe and in Ch in Japan and elsewhere. So um, gold will, uh, you know, have uh, a new uh, lease on life, I think, uh, uh, and uh, could rise to incredible heights. It's one place uh, where you can put assets. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I don't think there's going to be any hyperinflationary blow off. So cash uh, at the end of the day is going to be a very valuable commodity uh, because when we go through the big reset, as I call it, 
and bond prices uh, start becoming real and real estate cap rates uh, go back up to eight or nine rather than three or four where they're where they are today especially in you know the major uh, urban areas uh, then there are going to be great opportunities uh, to re-enter uh, these markets at much more reasonable sustainable income-based uh, uh, values. But so right now <laughs> is a threefold uh, advice, I think. Get out of stocks, get out of bonds, get into gold and uh, keep your uh, powder dry because, uh, you know, an opportunity after the crisis is going to come um, uh, of uh, really incredible uh, proportions. Great advice. I, I support all of that. And thank you for, for sharing that with us. We've been talking with David Stockman, author of the new book, trumped a nation on the brink of ruin and how to bring it back david we've hardly touched on obviously uh, a, a portion of what's in there and as i know you you and your writing it's going to be fantastically uh, rich for people who care about the details they matter the details matter and uh so tell people how they can uh, get your book when it's available well, and... it's available yeah chris thank you it's available on amazon now as ebook uh the printed uh, version we're rushing it to, to press but will be available uh, you know, in a week or two, it can be pre-ordered now. The one thing I want to say is, despite, uh, besides defining this whole crisis in a historical, like, 30-year context, uh, I do lay out uh, a direction uh, forward. And I have 10 deals that, you know, Donald Trump fancies himself the greatest deal maker of modern times. And uh, I, what I say in the book is, OK, if that's kind of the uh, uh, vocabulary you like, if that's uh, uh, directionally how you can formulate uh, how you would govern, here are 10 deals, a peace deal, a jobs deal, a sound money deal, a Glass-Steagall deal, a Federalist deal, a Liberty deal, a regulatory deal. I, I lay them all out. And uh, I think uh, that's um, another uh, part of the book that some readers uh, might find uh, very interesting. Well, you do mention in the subtitle that there is a there is a way out of this potentially. And of course, we'd have to start doing things very differently from the last 30 years trajectory. Do you believe, David, that that if we if we did make these new deals, uh, maybe an unfortunate way to phrase that, um, yeah. if we did, yeah. if we did come forward with with uh, some new ways of putting these forward, that that there is that we really could avoid some of the pain, or do we just have that pain before us, and we're going to have to make deals to make the best of it? Well, I think the pain is going to happen because the system is. Uh, so inertia ridden right now and is so dominated by, again, the uh, Washington Wall Street uh, elites that until uh, they're kind of blown out of position and discredited in a major dramatic and uh, disruptive way, I, I don't think policy is going to change. But once that opening is provided, then maybe people will say, yeah, maybe capitalism will work without a central bank that is uh, basically uh, running the casino, turning, you know, the financial markets into a casino. Maybe they'll say, hey, wait a minute, the Cold War ended 30 years ago. Maybe we don't need mm -hmm. uh, to have a confrontation with Russia. Maybe uh, uh, Trump should make a deal with Putin. Maybe we could actually disband NATO. Maybe we could reduce the defense budget by a couple hundred billion dollars. Maybe we could get out of the Middle East and let the local Shia and Sunni fight it out themselves. So the point is, if, if we have a big enough uh, upheaval and the status quo uh, comes under, uh, you know, fundamental assault, uh, then there might be an opening uh, for some of these uh, new directions. But uh, I don't think uh, it's anything that the system, if you want to use that word, is going to voluntarily embrace uh, until uh, it's driven from power and, uh, you know, a big uh, political disruption occurs. That's essentially what Trump is. He's a large political disruption. There are some real risks to it, obviously, but nothing, as I said in the book, compared to the status quo. I said, I, you know, and I lay out in some detail the areas where I disagree profoundly uh, with Trump, including all his uh, 
you know, manga, all of his uh, shrill rhetoric about uh, crime being out of control, which is really not true, and I lay that out, or that there are terrorists lurking uh, in every town and village and city in America, which is not true. Uh, you have a much better chance of being killed by lightning than you do by mm -hmm. a terrorist attack. So I, I lay all this out, but my point is nothing could be worse than uh, Hillary Clinton and another four years of the same thing that we've been doing at this late stage of the game. Because if you try it at this late stage of the game, uh, you're going to end up in a war with Russia, which is crazy and unnecessary. You're going to end up with a total uh, breakdown of the uh, monetary system if the Fed goes into QE, 5, 6, whatever it might be. Uh, you're going to end up with a bankrupt country if you try huge fiscal stimulus uh, in order to uh, reverse a recession that's clearly uh, overdue and uh, coming down the road, uh, you know, uh, visibly as we speak. So, um, you know, that that's the bottom line. We need a disruption and there is nothing worse than the status quo. That's what's ruined us. And if we get the disruption, uh, then here are 10 uh, fundamental ideas uh, to, uh, you know, uh, reset uh, the whole governance uh, process to, to really restore small government and um, vigorous uh, capitalist prosperity. David, you say disruption. I say intervention for a punch drunk uh, empire that that's, <laughs> it seems to doesn't know when to say no. And uh, the the as we're recording this, the news coming out of Syria regarding uh, the United States and NATO poking at Russia even more seriously. We're in active, open, what seems to be military conflict at this point. This is, of course, extremely worrying. And I, for one, uh, have no interest in seeing my nation go to war with Russia over reasons I can't articulate, except. We don't like it when people don't do exactly what we say in the way we say it, no matter how bad that is for their standpoint. So, yes, could we find somebody who could actually negotiate with the world rather than uh, bully the world? Uh, obviously, time to, to begin that process long ago. So any continuation of the status quo, in my mind, I agree with you completely, is just getting us two or three more rungs up an already dangerously high stepladder. Uh, the fall will be really uh, potentially fatal if, if we keep up that uh, path. So, David. Yes, I might say, Chris, just in completing this thought here, uh, one third of the book, the last one third, is addressed to the international uh, arena oh, nice. and the question of what I call uh, imperial policy and uh, all of the uh, disasters that it has generated around the world, especially since 1991 when the Cold War ended and we could have dismantled the whole uh, Cold War machine, but they found new missions. And, you know, half of what's going on in the world today is simply uh, mission creep, uh, mission justification, and uh, it's uh, very dangerous and it's even bringing us to uh, flashpoints in places like Syria or eastern Ukraine, the Donbass, which are utterly uh, unrelated to the mm -hmm. security of any American in any city or town from coast to coast. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, there's so much more to discuss there as well. So, uh, Listen, David, it's been a fantastic conversation. I hope to continue it at some point in time, and uh, we're out of time right now. So how can people follow you more closely? They know how to find your book. We'll provide a link to that, of course, at the bottom of this podcast. And I, But I want people to know about you and your uh, website, and of course, you have a new service starting up as well. Yeah, uh, it's uh, the site is called David Stockman's Contra Corner. Uh, you can find that uh, just by Googling it today. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be converting that to a more uh, thorough day, a daily briefing uh, commentary from me and uh, some others on key issues in politics, finance, Wall Street, China, Japan, and everything in between. And uh, it, it will be a subscription service, but people uh, can... Um, uh, Google uh, my existing site, uh, David Stockman's Contra Corner, and uh, uh, find out uh, how to uh, sign up. 
Well, fantastic. David, thank you so much for your time today. Best of luck with the new book and people. You really should read it. Uh, David, of course, is going to have some of the best, most condensed uh, and uh, elegantly stated information in there. That book is Trumped, A Nation on the Brink of Ruin and How to Bring It Back. David, thank you so much. Very good to be with you. Thank you.